All right. So this morning we are carrying on in our letter to uh, uh, the letter of James uh, that he wrote to the dispersed uh, Jewish Christians uh, throughout uh, the known world at the time. Um, and and we're, we're in, entering into the fourth chapter um, of this book. And, and so far we've picked up on a lot of uh, themes. Uh, hopefully by this point now you know what the main point of the book is. And the, the main point of James writing this letter was to bring uh, these Christians into a more full maturity in their faith so that they could grow up in the faith and, and be uh, better followers um, of Christ. Uh, a part of that um, in the first chapter, he talks about having joy in trials and remaining steadfast and asking God for wisdom and being humble and not just hearing the word of God, but doing the word of God. And these were all things that James um, said that we needed to do in order um, to gain maturity and, and be more grown up followers. Um, after that first chapter, he gets into uh, the meat of the letter by telling us that, that our faith, uh, if our works don't back it up, is, is proven to be dead. Uh, that we, um, as followers of Christ, that if we truly do believe in God and we truly do believe in Jesus, then our lives, our actions, what we do uh, will follow that and our actions will prove that our faith is actually, um, in fact, genuine. And a part of that um, is, is maturity. You know, as we grow um, in our spiritual um, maturity and as we grow in our faith, our actions will follow uh, more of what we believe. Um, James follows that up with saying that the words of our mouth must also match our faith. You know, that if we have faith in God and we are truly following God and we are, um, uh, you know, truly have this faith, then the words that we speak, the way that we speak to other people uh, will show that to be true. Is we can't claim to have faith and then put other believers, put fellow Christians on blast and just break them down and discourage them and tear them down with our words. And if we do that, our faith is shown uh, to be a lie, to be a fraud. Uh, but if we claim Christ, then our words should be used to build others up. And that shows that that faith is genuine. Uh, James follows those two big topics up with how the, the wisdom of God is the wisdom that we need to be following. Uh, last week, we talked about how the wisdom of the world is, is un, uh, ungodly, it's unspiritual, it's even demonic. And, and James says, don't follow that wisdom, but instead follow the wisdom from above. Follow the wisdom of God. James says, if you follow the wisdom of the world, if you follow the influences of the world, then the fruit that's in your life will be uh, dissension and, and discord um, and, and disorder and dysfunction. He says, but if you follow the wisdom of God and the influences of the Holy Spirit, um, then that will guide us in, in the ways of God and we will be closer to him and the fruits of our life will be love and mercy and grace. So James breaks these things down. Um, our faith and our actions have a correlation. Our faith and our words have a correlation. And, and the wisdom that we follow, the path of our life, they have a correlation. And all of this sets up the next part that he's about to cover. Um, now, normally I don't like to spend that much time reviewing, but all of this goes together, all works uh, perfectly together. The actions of our lives show our faith to be true. The words of our mouth, uh, the mouths show our faith to be true. The wisdom and the influences that we follow determine where our words and where our actions go. So right after James addresses uh, the wisdom that leads us, uh, he goes into this thing and brings down the hammer on the worldliness uh, that we like to follow. He goes and he talks about warning us against worldliness, warning us against following the ways of the world. You can say, now he already addressed that in the last little bit of the chapter, and that's true, but James is going to bring this down. He's going to bring the hammer down so that we fully understand this. Because if you think back, if you think back to the Old Testament and you study the Old Testament and you study the New Testament, you look throughout all of human history, uh, people, uh, especially followers of God, are going to do everything they can to follow the world. You know, if you look at, at, in, in the book of Genesis, you look from creation to the flood, we see 10 generations of people who knew God, knew of God, you know, knew of Adam, knew of, of all of this great story and this, this great moment of creation. Yet we see them fall so far away from God that God was willing to wipe them off the face of the earth. 
And then what we see um, after God calls Abraham, Abraham takes his uh, nephew Lot uh, and then Lot goes and he gets in with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and he gets in with those people. And this is such a worldly and evil city that God destroys these two cities. We see this over and over and over again. We see Moses going up on the mountain to get the law, to get the Ten Commandments, and he's only up there for just uh, about a month and a half, and he comes back down, and the people of Israel have just forsaken God, forsaken Moses, and they go back to what they were doing in Egypt, and they build an idol, and they're worshiping that idol. When Moses gets back down, you see over and over and over again, we see the people of God chasing after the things of this world. You know, if you continue through the Old Testament, you see that the, the time of judges and the time of kings, you see the people of Israel rebelling against God and pushing God away, saying, I don't want anything to do with you. And as a result, they are taken into captivity. And then they go into captivity and then they cry out to God and God delivers them. And we see this cycle over and over and over again. This problem with following the things of the world has been a problem uh, since Adam and Eve. And James is going to speak on this and bring the hammer down and give this dire warning to God's people about following the world. And this is what he says in the first four verses of chapter four. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you don't have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you, and you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Oh, man, James really breaks it. Down there, he says, why in the world are, are you fighting all the time? He says, why in the world has humanity been fighting since the, the, the moment of creation? Why has humanity been, been fighting and at odds constantly? He says, there's always been wars. There's always been, you know, little, uh, you know, fights between siblings all the way up to wars between nations. Why is there so much struggle? Why is there so much fighting? Why is there so much discord? It's because of the desires that are within us. It's because of our broken and sinful nature pushes us to live like a world. Our brokenness and our simple nature push us to live on our own selfish ambitions and it causes all of these issues. We want something so badly, so badly, and the world tells us that we deserve it. The world tells us that we should have that thing and we want nothing more to have that thing and we want it so much that we're willing to murder another human being over. We see something that someone else has and we want it for ourselves so bad and the world says that's yours, you deserve it and, and you go and you steal and you hurt other people in order to get these things. We fight and we hurt others so that we can fulfill our passions and our evil desires and the worldly influences that push in on us leads us to those ends. The world leads us to giving in to the desires of our flesh and our own broken humanity and following the ways of the world leads us so far away from God. And James lets us know exactly how he, how God feels about the world. He said, he who would set himself up to be a friend of the world sets himself up to be an enemy of God. He who wants to be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. James puts it in black and white. There's no, you can kind of work down the middle. You can kind of have a little bit of the world, a little bit of God. He says, if you are a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. Now, in this word friend uh, that James uses here in the first century, it's not kind of what we think of now. We think of the word friend kind of like an acquaintance, like a Facebook friend, something like that. But this, this concept of friendship in the first century was kind of different. This would be someone you would share everything with. Uh, someone, you know, tight as you could be through thick and thin. So James says, if you want to be best friends, if you want to be buddy-buddy with the world, you are pitting yourself against God. He says, if you are wanting to be in with the world and, and be a part of the world and want all of the things of the world, then you are setting yourself up as an enemy of God. And notice what James calls the people here. He says, you adulterous people. 
you adulterous people. He says, you wanting to be with the world is you being unfaithful to God. James is literally saying, if you want to be with the world, you want to be in the world, you want the greatness of the world, you want, you know, the, the treasures of the world, you want the accolades of the world, then you are literally being unfaithful to God. He's literally calling us adulterers when we go after the world. After the world. Uh, and it's pretty significant here that James uses the feminine version of this word adulteress. He's literally calling them adulteresses, which goes back to the Jewish people being the bride of God. And James extends this metaphor to the followers of Christ being the bride of Christ. He is saying you have uh, pledged to be exclusively God's. You have pledged your life to exclusively be a follower of Christ. So when you go and you step out in the world, you are literally committing adultery with the world and cheating on God and cheating on Christ. He says you, you, you are married to Christ. You are married to God and you have vowed your exclusive allegiance. And when you go with the world, you are stepping out and you are literally cheating on God as an unfaithful partner. And we cheat on God who is the most faithful of all. And when we step out with the world, we are pushing God away saying we'd rather have the world than you, God. Even though you were the one that sent your son to this earth, even though you were the one who's loved us through it all, even though you were the one that even though we didn't deserve it, you were going to redeem us. Being friends with the world is being adulterous and being an enemy of God. And then James tells us why God doesn't want us to be like the world and then gives us a little bit of good news in the next couple of verses. He says, do you suppose it's no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that has made us to dwell, made, made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It says God jealously yearns over the spirit that he made for us. God jealously loves us. God has jealousy over us that when he sees us going the ways of the world, when he sees us going the ways of our broken nature, when he sees us going the ways of our own sinful and lustful desires, he makes him jealous because he wants us for himself. Says he jealously desires the spirit that he put in us. God, God created this spirit in us. God created us individually and he created us so that he could be with us. He created us so that we could be together with him. So when we go with the world and we chase after the things of this world, we are literally rebelling and pushing him away. But then James says, but he gives more grace. There's grace to cover that rebellion. There's grace uh, to cover that sin. There's grace to cover that unfaithfulness that we have exacted against God. There's grace for those sins. But James lets us know exactly where that grace comes from. He says that we receive that grace when we come to God in humility. And we talked a lot about humility last week. And that's why he says, um, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We are called to submit ourselves before God. We are called to submit ourselves before God because that is the way that we have to come to him in humility. We can't come to God and expect him to give us grace if we are coming in with an arrogant attitude. There's no way. When we come to him, we have to be humble. We have to be penitent. We are called to submit ourselves to God and resist the devil. And how great is the news that when we resist the devil, he will flee from us. James says, submit to God. 
Submit to God as us allowing him to lead and to guard and to direct us. And notice James uses the word submit as the same word uh, that Paul uses when he's talking about husbands and wives. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as they are the spiritual leader of the household. It's the same exact thing. James is saying, uh, followers of Christ, you need to submit yourself to God because he is in charge of you and he is taking care of you. And it's his responsibility to lead you through this. Submitting to God is, is us coming and saying, God, I trust you, and I know that you're going to take care of us, and I know that you have my best interest in mind, and I'm going to follow you wherever you go and wherever you tell me. We submit to God. We submit to God as the bride of Christ. And we resist the devil, knowing that if we do, he will flee from us. The tempter will flee from us just in the same way that he fled Jesus after the temptation in the world. We submit to God. We resist the devil and the leadings of the world will flee. That is a great truth, but it all comes with submitting ourselves humbly before the God of the universe. And that next couple of verses, that, that kind of leads us to the next couple of verses, which is the heart of this letter. This entire letter so far has been kind of building up and leading to these couple of verses. This is verses 8 through 10. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy be turned to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It says, come to God and he will envelop you in his love. He will envelop you in his grace. He will cover you with his care. But in order to do that, you have to come in the right manner. We cannot come to God and draw near to him with sin and pride and arrogance in our hearts. We cannot come to God and say, yeah, I'm a sinner, but who is it? We can't come to God and say, yeah, I've lived like the world and I'm not really sorry because hey, it just is, it is what it is. Just splash me with a little bit of grace uh, and we'll be good and then we'll just go on living. That's not how we draw near to God. James says, cleanse your heart or cleanse your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your murderous and envious and coveting hands. Wash that nature off your hands. Wash that filth um, and unfaithfulness away. He says, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Wash your hands and purify your hearts. Now, this is one of those things that gets lost in translation, really lost in the cultural translation. Uh, in, in the Jewish culture, washing your hands was symbolic of cleaning your heart. So you would, you would go in, and before you went to the temple, you would literally wash your hands, and that showed that your heart was clean. Uh, there are several uh, psalms that say, you know, if your uh, clean hands lead to a uh, clean heart, and therefore you can stand before God. So washing your hands made you clean enough before standing before God, uh, according to the Jewish rites. Uh, and, and just P.S., how in the world did we not use that during COVID, trying to get people to wash their hands? Right? Anyway. Uh, but it was a Jewish rite that you had to wash your hands to ceremonially be clean enough to go before God. So the priests, would, before they would enter the temple, before they would offer up any sacrifice, they would ceremonially wash their hands. Uh, and during Jesus' ministry, this came up. And in Mark 7, we see the Pharisees get all over Jesus because his disciples are eating food without properly washing their hands before they ate. And Jesus basically, basically says, look, you guys have washed your hands, but your hearts are filthy. I'd rather their hearts be clean and their hands be dirty. It's defiled far, far from God. So James, when he's writing this, he is covering all the bases uh, for the Jewish listeners. He says, look, you need to clean your hands. You need to clean the outside of your body, but you also need to purify your hearts so that the inside of your body is pure as well. He says, make it all right. Clean and pure heart will lead to having clean hands and being fully devoted to God, submitted and faithful to him. The actions will bring glory and honor to him. James says, wash your hands, purify your heart. And he calls the reader a double-minded person, someone who has the, king, the, the mind for the kingdom of God, but also a mind for the world at the same time. <clears throat> having a mind for following Christ at the same time, having a mind for following the simple nature uh, that we have within us. And he says, purify your heart, get away from all of that. 
And then James tells us the exact nature, the exact mental attitude that we have to have when we come back to God. He says, be wretched, mourn, and weep. He says, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy be turned to gloom. It doesn't sound very godly, does it? It doesn't sound very happy, does it? I mean, wasn't James just talking about being joyful a couple chapters ago? Be wretched and mourn and weep. That word wretch literally means to be miserable. Mourn and weep literally means to wail in grief and sorrow. Why would James tell followers of Christ that they needed to be miserable and that they needed to wail in mourning and grief and in sorrow? Because that is the proper response that we should have to our sin. That's the proper response that we should have when we are living adulterous lives against God. Let's be real, we don't like talking about that in the American church. We don't like talking about uh, that in our church, church culture anymore. You won't see any famous mega church preachers preaching on this. But our sin, our rebellion against God, our flirtations with the world, world our adulterous affairs should bring us immense grief. We should look at our sin, the sin that is in our life, and it should break us. We should look at our sin and be torn apart. We should look at our sin and say, oh my God, what have I done? How have I treated God in this way? How can I turn my back on the God of the universe? How in the world can I treat a God who sent his own son to save me in this way? How in the world can I, with all these blessings and redemption and forgiveness and grace that has been poured upon me, how in the world can I still chase after the king of the world? How in the world is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the most high God, done everything he can to bring me back, yet I still just push and push and push him away? Our sin should break us. Our flirtation with the world should tear us apart. For some reason, we've come to this place in church culture where we just don't even care anymore. We all sin, so it's all good. God's grace will cover me, so it's, it's all good. I can just do whatever I want to do. That's garbage. That's not what James is saying at all. That's not at all what Paul is saying throughout the entire book of Romans. James says your sin should break you. You should be miserable and you should be wailing and weeping over the fact that you have turned your back on God. James says you need to be coming to a place of repentance. James is calling us to put off the sin that's in our heart, to turn and run in the opposite direction of the sin that is separating us from God. To turn back, to turn away from that and chase after God, to chase after godliness. We call out to God and say, God, I'm a sinner. Please save me. And we need to get away from it. And then James ends with the heart of the letter with this great truth. He says, humble yourself before God and he will exalt you. Come to God humbled. Come to God repentant. Come to God with no pride or arrogance or conceit in nature and God will lift you up. When we come to God with a repentant heart, we come to God knowing that we've sinned. We come to God laying it all out, saying, God, I am a lowly, horrible sinner, and these are all the things that I've done against you, and I repent of these, and I'm turning away from these things. Then God will return that joy. He will return that laughter, and it will be eternal. James says, don't be friends with the world. Being friends with the world makes you an enemy of God. Instead, you should be weeping and mourning over your sin and humbly coming back to God. And that, re that leads us right into more actions that follow the heart. The next two verses say this. Don't speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges her brother, his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. 
But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but you're a judge. There is only one lawgiver and one judge, he who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So right after on this speech, right after this, this great speech on, on moving away from God and, and being in the world and, and how we should uh, come to God and be humble, James says, why in the world are you talking about your brother? Why in the world are you judging other Christians and speaking against them? Now, this may seem unconnected. This may seem like James kind of took a 180 turn there, but they're perfectly connected. He says, humbly come before God, submit yourself before God, lowly come before God. Can you judge someone else? Can you judge another follower of Christ if you are humble before God? Can you judge a fellow follower of Christ if you are currently grieving and mourning and weeping and wailing over your own sin? There's no way. Imagine you just cheated on your spouse and you're in the middle of an affair uh, with, with someone else and you find out someone else is having an affair also. Would you take them and, and make that public? No. You condemn this person for having an affair when you're currently living in an affair yourself. That's why James says, who in the world are you to judge your own neighbor? Who are you to call someone out for anything? You've been living like the world. You've been living on your, for your own desires. You've been following the prince of this world, the devil, and you're going to try to call someone else out and judge them and condemn them. <laughs> James is literally saying, worry about yourself. Worry about your own wicked heart. Worry about your own repentance and you humbly coming back to God. Come to God. Submit to God, resist the devil, don't live like the world. This is the game plan for living a godly life. This is the foolproof strategy for living for God and following Christ in this life. Now, James didn't, you know, write this code. He didn't break the code. Uh, this has been the game plan since day one. And so many New Testament writers echo James in here. Uh, perhaps the most famous is, is my favorite couple of verses uh, from Paul in Romans 12. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. He says, present your bodies, present your lives, present what you do as a sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable. He says, this is your spiritual worship before God. But how do we do that? We do that by not being conformed to the ways of this world. We do this by not being conformed to the broken and evil and sinfulness of this world, but instead looking to God to see what his will for our lives uh, is. This is our spiritual worship before God. This is how we walk uh, in this world in the way that God has called us to, not as friends of the world, not as adulterous people cheating on God with the world, but being transformed to see what God's will is so that we can chase after him and chase after his will. If we are like the world and we are chasing after the world and seeking the world's approval, then we will be far from God. Jesus made this point super clear when he was teaching uh, in the upper room right before the crucifixion. Here's what he said. He said, if the world hates you, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, because I chose you out of this world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Jesus says the world's going to hate you. Jesus said the world is going to persecute you because it persecuted me. The world is going to come after you because it came after me. Yet that's what we chase after. Yet that's what we are seeking in our daily lives. As followers of Christ, we're chasing after the world. We want to be loved by the world. We want to be friends with the world. We want to be tight with the world. Yet Jesus says the world's going to want to kill you if you're living like me. 
We want the things of the world, the power of this world, the riches of this world. We want the benefits of the world. We want the recognition of the world. We want the pleasures of this world. We chase after them and we chase after the world and all the things they can offer all the while pushing God away. Yet Jesus says, instead of you chasing the world, the world should hate you because you're living like me. It should be trying to persecute you and kill you all because you're following me. Yet we're chasing after the world. James says, stop that. James says, get as far away from that as possible. James says, you need to be wretched. You need to weep and you need to mourn this attraction that you have for the world. You need to repent and return back to God. As followers of Christ, we have to get away from chasing the world and we have to get to chasing after God and chasing after the kingdom of God, chasing after eternity. Look what Paul wrote in chapter 3 of Colossians. He says, if then, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are of this earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. He says, we've been raised to life with Christ. See, we've been raised to see God in heaven. He says, we were dead in our sin. We were dead in our sin, but through the death of Christ and him coming out of the grave, we have been risen with him. We've been brought up again with him. He says, you were dead in your sin, but now because of Jesus, because of the, the crucifixion, because of the resurrection, you have been raised up with him. Why in the world would you want to go back to the world? Why in the world would you go back to the thing that put you in the grave in the first place? Why in the world would you chase after something that's going to lead you away from God? Why would you want to chase after the things of this world that led you to your separation with God originally? He says, don't set your mind on the things of the world. Set your mind on the things that are above. We should be seeking after the things of God. We should be seeking after his will. We should be looking at, at the eternity that we will live in one day. He says, set your mind on heaven and not on this earth. That is the key uh, to not living in this world. If we are focused on eternity, if we are focused on heaven, if we see ourselves and our lives and our existence in this long-term view, then the desires of this world will not be so strong. If we see our existence and eternity in heaven with God because of the grace of God and the sacrifice of Christ, then the things of this world will mean nothing to us. Because when we see ourselves in eternity with God in heaven, we're not going to want to chase after the menial, trivial, sinful, temporary things of this world, but instead we want to be as close to God as possible. Man, this great section by James, this is the heart of the letter. Don't chase after the world. Don't chase after the things that this world has to offer. Don't chase after the things that are going to lead to your death spiritually. It's just being friends with the world and setting yourself up as an enemy of God. You're becoming a cheating spouse that is far from his heart. Instead, you should come to God, draw near to him, mourn over your sin, and humbly come to him for his grace and his forgiveness. We should do everything that we can to tear ourselves away from chasing after the world. This world is going to do whatever it can to steer us away from the goodness that God has for us. This world will do anything that it can to bring us sin and brokenness, bring it into our lives so we can push God away. So as we close this morning, I want you to look into that spiritual mirror. I want you to look into that mirror and ask God to bring some conviction into your life. Ask God to send the Holy Spirit to you right now to show you where you are loving the world. Take that moment right now. Are you chasing after this world? Are you chasing after the riches of this world? Are you chasing after the pleasures of this world? Are you chasing after the accommodations of this world? Are you chasing after the accolades of this world? Are you chasing after all of the things that this world can offer you? Are you living your life for this 
world right now, this 70, 80, 90 years that you have on this earth, is that what you're living for? Or are you living for God? Are you living for the kingdom of God? Are you looking forward to eternity knowing that this is just a temporary, temporary thing? So in these next few moments as, as we come and we worship together, I want you to ask God to show you where you fail. Because if you are chasing after the world and you're currently in an affair with the world, you need to repent. You need to, to be wretched. You need to mourn and you need to weep over your sin. You need to humbly ask God to bring you back into his heart. You need to humbly come to God and submit yourself before him. Because God's grace is great. God's love is great. And Christ's sacrifice is enough uh, to, to bring us fully back to God. Don't chase after the world. Don't put your hope in the world. Instead, put your hope in Christ. Put your hope in the living hope of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. And God, we're so thankful uh, that we have your word in James. We are so thankful uh, that we can open up uh, this great letter and, and see where we are failing and where we have messed up and where we've missed the mark. And God, we pray right now that you will convict us. We pray right now that you will just show us every single aspect of our lives where we are living for the world. There may be places where we don't even know, places where we're living for the world where we're just not even aware because we've been doing it for so long. God, we pray that you will just shine that light into our hearts right now. And God, I pray through that conviction that that will lead to repentance and that will lead to us begging you for forgiveness. God, I pray that as we go through that, that we can commit ourselves to living for you, that we can submit ourselves to you. God, we humbly come before you now. We love you, we're yours, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
so thankful that we were allowed to come to your house this morning. God, we are so thankful for Jesus, for the hope that we have through him. The hope for grace, the hope for forgiveness, the hope for redemption. God, we're thankful for that. Be with us as we leave this place. Let us be people filled with hope, living for you. We love you more yours, and we pray that all the glory and the honor go to you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.